All right, this is gonna be fun. So I recently figured out that I've read almost everything on the Goodreads best science fiction top 50 list. I'll put a link in the description. I think it's actually like a top whatever list. The list just keeps going on, but I know I've read almost everything in the top 50. So what I wanna do is tier rank all of them. Any that I have not read, I'm gonna put down in need to read or NTR. And at the end, I'll rank them as how likely I am to read them. I'm gonna be judging these based on how much I enjoyed them. And I'm also going to be ranking them against one another. So for example, the first one is Ringworld. That book is awful. I do not like it at all. It will be in the D tier. But then, I don't know, something else that's bad on the list might get a bit of a bump because at least it's better than Ringworld, which is most things written in the English language. But we don't have to go into that until right now. Let's start ranking. So we've got Larry Nevin's Ringworld. That is D tier. That is bad. I cannot stand that book. Not only is it just all of the worst tropes of the era it was written in, which I think was the 1960s. It's also just like boring most of the time. Now the premise is cool. There's like a world that's a ring, you know, it's exactly where Halo got the idea from. And I like that, but then the characters are just bad. One of them, there's this like eugenics program that just made people have better luck or something. And it's really stupid and she's kind of stupid, but she can be because she's just naturally lucky and everything just works out for her. And it's just like bad. So going in the D tier. Stephen King's The Stand. That is A tier. I love The Stand. I think it's one of the best post-apocalyptic novels I've read. I will say that the uncut version is obscenely long and it will burn people out pretty quickly. I'm looking forward to reading the original edited version. Bridger from the Library Ladder mentioned that that's his favorite version. It's just a lot tighter. There's not as much nonsense. Now, I enjoyed the nonsense because the little digressions that Stephen King does are fun, but sometimes the pacing of a story suffers from it. So I'd like to try the tighter version. Maybe the edited version is S tier. I guess we'll find out eventually. All right, the first one I have not read, Carl Sagan's Contact. Real quick, now that I remembered, this is not technically the top 50. This is the top 52 or 53. And the reason for that is because on here, you'll see that when I get to it that the Foundation Trilogy is on here and also Foundation Book 1, Foundation Book 2, and Foundation Book 3. They're all in the top 50. And it seems like just a waste to do that. It's like in the fantasy section where seven of the top top 10 are Harry Potter. It's like, all right, I mean, cool. We just cut out 18% of the top 50 dedicated to a single writer. So that's cool. So I cut that down and I also did the same thing for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because the five book trilogy is in the top 50 and the original book. So I just left the original book and it let me add a few other things that I've read that deserve to be on this list. They should be in the top 50 and it's kind of a joke that they're not. But now we get back to it. The Road, Cormac McCarthy. This is S tier. While The Stand is one of the best post-apocalyptic novels I read, the Road is like at the top of that list or very close to it. It might be tied with a few other things. The nice thing about The Road is it is a wonderful introduction to post-apocalyptic novels for people who like genre fiction and people who like lit fiction. It's just a great introduction not only to Cormac McCarthy, but also to post-apocalyptic fiction. And I think one of the reasons it's a great introduction to Cormac McCarthy is because it's his least insane book. I guess I would put it. When you read his writing, he doesn't use punctuation. His sentences can be two paragraphs long and it can just be jarring. Same thing with dialogue. If there's more than two people in a conversation in his book and you're looking at it with your eyes, there's a lot of times you're like, what, who? I don't know who's speaking right now, but since most of the book is just the man and the boy, it's a lot easier. He does such a good job of writing about what has been lost, and I will probably never read it again. I read it in my early 20s, and now I have a child who is around the age of the boy, and it would probably break me if I read that book now. Speaker for the Dead, Orson Scott Card. This is A tier, and while Orson Scott Card is a bit of a turd, you can enjoy his stuff by buying them used. He gets no money. You can enjoy the a few things he's wrote that are outstanding. I think Speaker for the Dead is really, really good. It's a complete 180 to Ender's game. And you're seeing Ender as he's gotten older and things have changed and he's coping with what happened in Ender's game. And I think it's just good. Actually, I'm gonna move that to B tier because there's other things from this series that belong in A tier and I don't think that it does. On to the next one, Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers is a B tier and is probably the highest a Heinlein book is gonna get on this list. I think Starship Troopers is a important, not only because of the themes of the book, but because it helped define the modern military sci-fi genre. 
know. And I think it definitely deserves a place on here. And it's one of the stronger Heinlein books. Like, here's the problem is an S tier Heinlein book is still like a B tier novel compared to most things. I have a video about being a Heinlein hater, but also recommending Heinlein books that should be read. So you don't fall into the trap of reading the awful ones. So you might want to check that out. I elaborate on Starship Troopers in that. Animal Farm by George Orwell. That is an A tier book. I say it's A tier. It's not quite S tier because it's not mind blowing, but I think it's better than 1984, which will be coming up eventually. And I think it's just a really good, tight, small novel that gets across what it's trying to do in a very, very compelling way. I love the fact that you can read it in junior high and understand what's going on. And then you can read it late in high school, early in college and get even more out of it. And then you can forget you've read it and read it again as an adult, you know, 19, 20 years after you graduated from high school. And you're just like, holy crap. And it's just a completely different book every time. And you get so much out of such a small book. Book that it definitely belongs in a tier. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. This is C-ish, D-ish tier. We're going to go D tier. I will move stuff as we're going just because I want to and it's my tier list. We're saying which solid gold hit is better type thing. So there's going to be a lot of wiggling around and a lot of people are not going to agree with this list at all, but we can all accept that, yeah, this is some of the greatest stuff ever written. But The Moon is a Harsh Mistress is definitely toward the bottom of that. Old Man's War by John Scalzi. This is tied with Starship Troopers. Like it's almost the same book. I don't think it's like exactly the same, but it's that same style. And it's definitely an homage to Starship Troopers and the Forever War. And I think it's really good. I like John Scalzi's writing. There's a lot of Scalzi haters out there and I don't understand why. Like, yeah, and I think it annoys people that he has this very modern snappy dialogue. All of his dialogue reminds me kind of like Joss Whedon style dialogue, which is fine. I know that annoys a lot of people, which might be why there's a lot of Scalzi haters, but I think he's really good. And I think that he helped keep the science fiction genre alive when it looked like it was dying. I remember going into Barnes and Noble, which the science fiction section is already tiny at Barnes and Noble. I remember it being essentially Scalzi books and reprints of crap from 50 years ago, they're on this list. And that was it. So I think that Scalzi is an important writer, especially over the last 20 years. So he definitely deserves to be at least B. A Clockwork Orange I have not read yet. Wrinkle in Time, I haven't read yet. Solaris. Solaris is solidly B tier for me, only because I've gotten two thirds of the way through it twice. And it's incredibly creepy and I really like it, but I just peter out and I don't know why. And then I found out that a lot of the stuff toward the end has a lot of technical stuff going on and it's not in the same. It doesn't have the same feel as the first half of the book. So I'm kind of glad I stopped reading it at that point. But I understand that it is like a solid piece of the science fiction conversation. The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. This is a solid C. And it's a solid C because it's better than Ringworld and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, but I still don't like it that much. And one of the reasons is it's a fix up. So it's a bunch of his short fiction woven together to create a novel. And the problem with that is the same problem all fix ups suffer from in that you have five star short stories in there and then you have one star turds and you're weaving gold to poop. So you end up with just like poopy gold and no one wants poopy gold. So it kind of averages out to like just mid or maybe le slightly less than mid when you're comparing it to other works in the genre. I will say some of the short stories in there are amazing. Some of the best I've ever read, but then some of them are exposition vomit that I wish I would have never bore witness to. So let's move on. The Dispossessed. I tried reading it again recently and I DNF'd it again. I'm going to put it in D tier, even though I have not finished it or gotten close to finishing it, but it's going in D tier because of my personal experience with it. And also I would put everything else else I've read from Ursula K. Le Guin so far above it that I don't know why it's even on this list. I, I mean, I know why it's on this list and it just drives me nuts that I don't enjoy it. I keep getting to the same point, like 10 or 15% of the way into the book. And I'm like, all right, this is fine. We're going for it. The Dispossessed, everyone loves this book. Cool. It's got anarchists. I can vibe with this. And then it starts doing like the flashbacks. And I do not like flashback than present flashback present. It just drives me 
nuts. It's hard to follow. It can be jarring. And it's probably my least favorite narrative structure in fiction. But sometimes it's done really well. I mean, you know, look at Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive series. 40% of the book flashbacks, aren't they? Or close to it. And I like it. But it's, it's telegraphed very well. And it's not nearly as confusing or jarring. So The Dispossessed is going down low, even though I haven't finished it. But I did try for the third time just this week. Flowers for Algernon. S tier. I mean, it's Flowers for Algernon. Not only is it beautifully written, the themes and the overall feel of the book is just magnificent. I've never read a book with so much respect and love for people with intellectual disabilities, and it's just amazing. And you have this theme of like, if you're more intelligent, are you less happy? And another theme of overcoming trauma and like, what does it mean to be happy? And can you love someone at their best and their worst? And just so many things. And it, it's just so beautiful. I could not believe it when I finally read it. Please read it. Everyone out there that hasn't, you've got to add it to your TBR. H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. That is D tier. I mean, it's H.G. Wells. I appreciate what he did for the genre and I don't mind H.G. Wells, but if I'm comparing him to everyone else on here, yes, he's at a disadvantage, but still he's toward the bottom. I will say that that's 1895 when this came out. So I, I respect what it did for the genre but it's still gotta be low. The Star is My Destination by Alfred Bester. This is A tier. I love this book. You can tell when you read it that it was a huge influence on The Expanse. Ty Frank actually said that it was. Not only is there belter slang in The Star is My Destination, there is an OPA, like the Outer Planetary Alliance or whatever. Like there's the people in the belt who are rebelling and it's just good. And it is pre-cyberpunk. It had to have influenced cyberpunk. There's augmentations. There's all this weird tech. It's a story about revenge. I really like it. It's not my favorite Alfred Bester. And I don't think my favorite one is on the top 50, which is The Demolished Man. And I would put that in S tier if, if it was on here. But yeah, The Star my destination is great that's one of those like mandatory reads i mentioned it in my pre-cyberpunk video so if you're interested you should go check that out jurassic park jurassic park is b tier i love michael Crichton, and i read jurassic park in junior high and i was just like this is so good this is better than the movie which of course it was but i was 13 i didn't realize how much better books were than movies and yeah i mean it's jurassic park what do you want me to tell you i do enjoy reading it now and thinking about the dinosaurs with feathers because not only is it just hilarious that this giant feathered thing would be eating people and destroying things but that's how they're supposed to look and i know michael Crichton. people approach him about it and they're like hey why don't they have feathers blah blah and he's like it's the frog dna that's why they don't have feathers i don't know what to tell you which you know he had to come up with that after we discovered dinosaurs and feathers but i think it's funny for both those reasons rendezvous with rama s tier rendezvous with rama is like one of my favorite first contact novels because not really a first contact but there kind of is it's like the fermi paradox the novel you have this asteroid that is like a colony ship on the inside and you have these people exploring it and there's no one there there's nothing in there that shows any signs of life for thousands millions of years who knows and it's incredibly unsettling and it's just so fascinating i mean i love arthur c clark so that helps the war of the worlds hg wells that's c tier i i really like the war of the worlds more than i do the time machine what's cool about the war of the worlds is when you're reading it yeah there's some things in it that date it to when it was written but it's really easy for you to just block those out and read it as if it's something that would have happened within the last 50 years. And I really, really like that. Alien invasions are cool. I mean, what else can I say? Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson. Haven't read it yet, so it's an NTR. 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is C tier. Or is it B tier? I'm gonna go C tier because there's a lot of Arthur C. Clarke I would put way above that and they're on this list. Leviathan Wakes, S tier. This thing is what a lot of people call post cyberpunk. It has a lot of influence from cyberpunk and it has even more influence from pre cyberpunk like The Star's My Destination. And the reason this is an S tier is because this series has been like a cornerstone of the genre for the last like 15 years. And it's just wonderful. I will say I haven't finished the series because the first book that has like a time jump, which I think is like the not next to last, but next to next to last book, it really frustrated me. I don't like time jumps. I don't like the whole, we're getting too old for this. We can't get along anymore, blah, blah, blah. And then they have to come together and do the exact same thing they were doing before, which just seems stupid. And I know there was like a time jump kind of because of the way the plot progresses through the series. It needed one, but I still don't like it. I also 
didn't like that that book basically recycled the plot from three of the previous books and just changed the character that you're following because you know all the books always have like the the main cast and crew and then like a new person that's a main pov for that story and the problem is is the main pov for that story his entire thing that he's doing is literally the exact same thing that happened a few books before but just slight tweaking like they shave the serial numbers off and i didn't like it i will finish the series i've been told that it is worth finishing so i will get to it i'm probably gonna wait until a couple of friends get close to the end of the series and i'll read it with them but it deserves to be up there it's one of the most important things that's come out for science fiction in a long time and i really like it so s tier it is ubic ubic i don't know how to say it by philip k dick that one's in ntr i haven't read it i like philip k dick i just haven't gotten to it i robot by isaac asimov i'm gonna put this this is a solid c i like i robot i really really like the robot stuff that asimov does much more than i do the foundation stuff so yeah i robots good waterhouse 5 by kurt vonnegut i'm gonna put this in c tier because compared to everything above it actually i'm moving jurassic park down it's the same level of quality as slaughterhouse 5 slaughterhouse 5 is good i like vonnegut i don't like that he refused to be known as a science fiction writer even though all he wrote was science fiction it gets c tier because i just like everything else above it a lot more but slaughterhouse 5 is one of his best books that i've read i think i've read like 60 percent of his novels he published if you're gonna read vonnegut read slaughterhouse 5 or the breakfast of champions which i think i like more very weird but i think i like it just a little bit more man in the high castle philip k dick this is a tier it's not s tier because i don't know but i really love the man in the high castle i love alternate history so when i read this in high school i was just like this is blowing my mind it's very very good i know there's going to be a lot of other philip k dick that i end up putting above this but for now this is a tier isaac asimov foundation trilogy this is d tier now it's d tier because i like the first book and i don't even know if many people like the first book compared to the other ones but the first book is the only one that was memorable out of those three i don't remember anything about book two or book three i know i read them but like i liked foundation but the fact that it's not in my brain anymore really says something about it because these other d tier books i remember a lot about but if it's both forgettable and just like okay when i'm reading it then it's going at the bottom fire upon the deep by Werner vingy this i have not read yet the handmaid's tale i'm not read that yet stranger in a strange land is d tier so robert heinlein has like his trifecta of books that is his message kind of what he's trying to get across in his fiction and that's stranger in a strange land starship troopers and the moon is a harsh mistress of those three the weakest is definitely stranger in a strange land stranger in a strange land has such a cool premise you have this guy who was born on mars and then he's the only human left on mars after something happens and he's raised by Martians, which are these telepathic slash telekinetic beings that are made of, I don't know, energy or something. They feel more like ghosts than they do actual beings. But anyways, he's raised by them. He has no idea what it means to be human. The book is about him figuring out what it means to be human, while also kind of balancing his Martianness and trying to tell the world about that and change things and all that. And that stuff is great. And then you have stupid crap like Jubal Harshaw, and then Mike's love interest lady sidekick thing, and she's terrible and then the book is just like really bad especially the uncut version holy crap the uncut version is just awful neuromancer by william gibson this is s tier holy crap we talk about cyberpunk that's cyberpunk i love everything about it i love the way it's written i love the pacing of it there's these really interesting scenes i forgot what i was listening to it was either a youtube video or a podcast about neuromancer but man they talk about this one scene where the main character is doing his little hacking and stuff and then he's got this other character that's got to be like the boots on the ground and she gets into this fight and the way the chapter is structured is you're through his pov but she has like basically like a chip in her brain too or whatever and he can kind of load into her like vision and senses and stuff and so you have him doing all this stuff and then it's it's like a camera shift into her pov and it's just super cool and i have never read anything quite like that and i love it and i mean it is one of the most influential things written in the 80s i mean holy crap also also, it has this timeless quality to it, which is incredibly ironic because even William Gibson's like, yeah, I didn't realize cell phones were going to be that big of a thing because there's like no cell phones in it. But what is in it is the way he describes things. Like at the beginning, one of the most famous quotes from it has to do with the sky at night and it looks like a dead television channel, which for people old enough, a dead television channel is like that staticky gray and black and like that... <laughs> 
sound. And for younger people, they're like, well, I don't know what this looks like. A dead television channel is black or like bright blue. It just depends on how old you are. But the thing is, the way it's written, it's interpreted differently based on your personal experiences. And I think that that is such a wonderful thing in a novel. I think his writing is timeless in just like the weirdest way possible. Forever War, S tier, Joe Haldeman. Man, I love Joe Haldeman's writing. And I think the Forever War is the best iteration of like this military fiction like Starship Troopers or Old Man's War. And also you get bonus points when like you're pouring your actual experiences into a novel. And for Joe Haldeman to use this novel as kind of a way to express what it felt like to come back from the Vietnam War, it's just amazing. And it's one of those books that's just so timeless. And for him to have this story about this veteran of war coming back and just feeling so detached from society. For him, it's not only time dilation, but his experiences. Like, I can only imagine that veterans of wars coming back always feel like that. There's like just this disconnect because these people that they're around now do not experience things the way they did in combat. And you end up only kind of feeling a kinship with the other people who have experienced the same things as you. And he does such a good job of talking about that in the book. And it's just wonderful. Ready Player One. So Ready Player One is D tier in writing and C tier in nostalgia, but I'm putting it back to D tier because a lot of people have listened to it. And while I don't mind Will Wheaton, I understand that most of the time he lowers the quality of a book for a lot of people. Like my wife refuses to listen to anything that has Will Wheaton as a narrator. So for an arbitrary reason like that, I'm going to put it in D tier. Also, it's probably one of the weakest books on this entire list because it is just like nostalgia fuel and that's it. I still like the book though. Hunger Games. Hunger Games is not not very good, but it is very important to the genre because it created a bunch of copycats that are somehow worse, so maybe it should be punished for that. So I'm going to put it in the D tier because like, it's fine. I think that the dystopian country that it's in makes absolutely no sense. And it's incredibly stupid. Do like that Suzanne Collins talked about one of the inspirations for it was not just ripping off the novel Battle Royale, but also she said she was watching TV and on one channel, which was CNN, she saw 19 year olds fighting in Afghanistan. And then she flips the channel to MTV and she sees 19 year olds on like Jersey Shore or some other reality TV show. And that just insane dichotomy dichotomy of a 19 year old acting spoiled and insane on reality TV and then a 19 year old sacrificing their life in a foreign country and it's like they're from the same place. Those two people could literally have been neighbors and it's just crazy and so she was like how about we take war and reality TV and put it together in this future American dystopia. It's just okay. But I appreciate what it's done for getting a lot of people into reading science fiction and dystopian fiction. The Left Hand of Darkness, A tier. I think that The Lathe of Heaven is better and that should be in the top 50 over The Left Hand of Darkness or The Dispossessed. But while I enjoy The Left Hand of Darkness, I don't know if it's quite S tier. Maybe I'll move it to S tier on a reread. I really enjoy the fact that it's like, hey, all you people obsessed with gender, what happens if there's no gender? What do we do now? And I mean, this was in the 60s. So I just love the fact that a lot lot of the issues now that we're focusing on she was addressing way back then in ways that I don't know if anyone's really done since then it's just great it's just one of the best books on like seeing like what a world would be like if gender didn't exist and also seeing what a world like that would be with someone there that has a bias when it comes to gender and kind of how that changes throughout the book that was really cool Canticle for Leibowitz A tier and I say it's A tier because there's a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction I like more also it can be hard to read read. I don't think it's for everyone, but I think everyone should try it. It's a really fascinating book that was definitely a major influence on things like Fallout because this place feels like Fallout, like straight up. I mean, they're in a bunker and they're trying to figure out how to resurrect technology. And it's like this weird order of priests. It's like some more religious version of like the Brotherhood of Steel or something. I, I think it's it's pretty cool. Frankenstein is B tier. I read the 1818 text. I actually just finished it yesterday and it's good. I understand why people like it as much as they do. And I also appreciate that Mary Shelley wrote something that defined a genre when she was like 19 years old. It's incredible. And the whole story of her writing it is like a challenge from like Lord Byron or whatever, which also is crazy. And who's letting Lord Byron around 18 year olds? Oof. But yeah, Frankenstein's good. I don't have much to say about it. I got things out of it. Probably not as much as other people do. Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, S tier. I think this is the best Arthur C. Clarke book. So I'm putting it up there with Rendezvous with Rama because they're just so different. I really like Childhood's End because it is tragic. I mean, you're seeing 
without getting too far into spoilers, you're watching toward the end these parents witness their children change to the point that they can't understand their kids anymore and their kids can't understand them, which kind of feels like being a parent. And that hurt to read. And also, it's just so good. I really love everything about Childhood's End. Arthur C. Clarke is an amazing writer. Ender's Game, A tier. It's better than Speaker for the Dead. I mean, Ender's Game is just awesome. But I mean, I think most people have read Ender's Game and if they haven't, you should. The book's not big. I think it's really cool that it created like the battle school trope. I don't know if there was much before that, but I also find it absolutely crazy that they're like, hey, we need people with really good reflexes, but are also easy to manipulate. And it's like, oh, you mean children. And it's just really interesting that back then he's writing about children and their crazy reflexes. And now we have 16 year olds that win like $3 million in Fortnite tournaments and stuff because of their crazy reflexes and that brain elasticity allows them to just hyper focus into this thing and specialize in a way that an adult can't do so i really like it i actually like ender's shadow more than ender's game but that's because your boy loves bean i think bean is an amazing character and i really like that other series in the enderverse like bean's series is just super cool orson scott card somehow got really good at writing like techno thrillers i think that's what they are or like techno military thrillers or something bean is cool dune s tier I mean, it's Dune. What what am I supposed to say? Dune is great. Dune is awesome. Uh, God Emperor of Dune is better. It's my favorite book in the series. No, I will not elaborate. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, S tier. There is no better funny science fiction. Douglas Adams was a genius. I love his writing. He brings me nothing but joy. I can't wait to read more of his works, like the Dirk Gently series. Looking forward to that. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, please give it a try. Very short book, little baby book. The Fall of Hyperion. I have not read yet, but I will be rectifying that relatively soon. Yeah, I was missing something from the list and somehow added foundation again on accident. So that's cool. I was just talking about the Bean series. Uh, Ender Shadow, I love. Ender Shadow is Ender's game, but from Bean's perspective. And the thing about Bean is he is a hyper genius beyond levels that were possible. The amazing thing about him is he's like this anti-Ender because he's so smart that he's essentially lost empathy, which is a callback to Flowers for Algernon because the smarter that man gets, the more of a jerk he is because he just kind of loses loses his ability to feel like other people. Bean isn't lacking in that, but Bean is also smart enough to know that he can't let it get in the way. So like the ending to Ender's Game, which I'm not going to spoil, when you're in Ender's Shadow, Bean comes to the conclusion before Ender about what should be done. And he's like, all right, this is what we have to do. It's before Ender figures it out. And Bean was going to do it. And Bean was smart enough to understand the consequences of it, but was still willing to do it because he knew it was the only way. So I love that. I think Ender's Shadow is really good. I love the Bean series. So yeah, like I said, Bean is my boy. 1984 by George Orwell. C tier, because I don't really like the book, but I understand why it should be higher up on the list. And I think upon a reread, I would probably like it more. But also, I don't know if I want to reread it. I understand the whole double think and all that stuff. And wow, this is like literally 1984. My life is literally 1984 now, which also that bothers me. So we'll leave it lower. Hey, you know what's better than 1984? Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. A tier. I love Brave New World. I really really like that we get a lot of things that are happening now like hey we need to keep the world happy but people don't have fulfilling lives well pharmaceuticals are cheap let's just do that which i'm not knocking pharmaceuticals they're wonderful there are things you cannot fix without them i mean when people disparage others that have like mental illness and they're like why don't depressed people just be happy it's like the chemicals in their brain don't allow them to do that that's like telling someone with diabetes why don't you just process sugar i just find it really interesting that this society is built on genetic modification a very strict social strata and drugs are used to cope with reality. So, you know, that doesn't sound like anything we deal with right now. I mean, there's no genetic manipulation that we know of. We're not in the Brave New World yet. And, you know, of like the 1984s and stuff like that, I think Brave New World is just the better of those. Speaking of Brave New World being better, I don't like Fahrenheit 451. I'm going to D tier that. I like 1984 more, but that's not saying much. And Fahrenheit 451 has also made me think maybe Ray Bradbury is not for me, but Bridger from the Library Ladder has convinced me to give Ray Bradbury more of a chance, especially as short fiction. So I will. But my thing about Fahrenheit 451 is so many people are like, oh, it's about book burning and the destruction of literature. And then Ray Bradbury is like, it's about how TV rots your mind. And it's like, bro, if that's what you meant by it, you should have been a little more explicit. That's not what anyone gets out of that book. So maybe the understanding of a book is out of the author's hands or he just didn't do it right. Or anyways, not a Fahrenheit 451 enjoyer. Hyperion, Dan Simmons, S tier. Hyperion blew my mind. How do you make 
take science fiction Canterbury Tales and make it that good. Like Dan Simmons just flexes that he can write any genre in that book and it's amazing. The priest tale is incredibly disturbing. And then the, what is he? Like the scientist, I can't remember. The physicist or whatever he is. His tale broke my heart. I read it like almost a year ago now and I still am just incredibly sad every time I think about that story. It's just so good and I cannot wait to read The Fall of Hyperion. We'll get to it. Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a solid B tier. Also known as the actual title, which is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. It's very different than the movie. It's cyberpunk, man. I mean, it's not as good as like Neuromancer, but I like Blade Runner. I like the movie a lot. I think I like it more than the book. The Martian. The Martian is B tier. It could be higher because of its influence and just how it got so many people into science fiction, but also I don't think it's as good as the stuff in S or A tier. So we're going to put it in B tier. And yeah, I mean, it's The Martian. You know, the movie was good. The book is, of course, better. And I can't wait to read Project Hail Mary because I did not like Artemis at all. Holy crap, that book was bad. But I've heard that Project Hail Mary is just like The Martian, but better. We're at the end of this. Uh, now I'm just going to rank the ones I haven't read, which are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've read 42 of the top 50 ish. 42 is a cool number. But yeah, contact is like B or C tier. Like I want to read it, but I'm not really that in motivated. Same goes for a clockwork orange. I'll put that in B tier as well. A wrinkle in time is like C tier. I don't think I'm going to read that. I nah, will put it in D tier. It's like the least interesting on this list. Oh no, that's a lie. So it'll go in C. Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. I want to give it a try. I've only tried to read Neil Stevenson once and I didn't like it at all. So I'm hoping that Snow Crash is better. I've seen some recent reviews from people I trust about Snow Crash and they really liked it. So I'll definitely give it a chance. I was very down on Ubik. I had no interest in it. I read the premise and I'm like, I don't care. And then I saw some reviews recently from people I trust and that is now like S tier. Like I thought about starting it this week. I'm not going to, but I wanted to. I think that counts. A Fire Upon the Deep is S tier and it is one that I know I need to read. It's definitely part of that like overall great conversation of the science fiction genre. So I can't wait to get to it. It's going to be good. The Handmaid's Tale. That's D tier. I love Oryx and Crake. I like Margaret Atwood's writing. I do not care to read anything else from her because every time I try, I just don't like it. And she's another one of those writers that's like, I don't write science fiction. It's like, what would you call a dystopia like The Handmaid's Tale or Oryx and Crake other than science fiction? Like Oryx and Crake is literally a dystopia slash post-apocalyptic novel. So why are you refusing to be acknowledged as science fiction? Oh, because you want your lit fic friends to still like you. So it just grinds my gears. So yeah, D tier. I'm probably not going to read it. All of Hyperion is extra S tier. Put it where it actually goes. Come on. And and yeah, Fall of Hyperion will be read probably this year. I can't wait to get to it. I just loved Hyperion so much. It's going to be real good. This is my list. I hope you like it. Um, you probably don't. Let me know what you think should be moved up or down or where you would have put some of these things. Also, let me know what you think should be in the top 50 because The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin should be S tier. It annoys me that it's not in the top 50. I don't even know if it's in the top 75, but it's so much better than her other stuff because it's just mind blowing. Not only do you get her mastery of the craft, but you get these concepts and these themes that just should be higher up on this list. I mean, that's the thing about science fiction. You want science fiction to be breaking new ground. You want science fiction to just blow your mind about things that could be or things that should be. And some of these books just don't do that. Also, the more I look at this, the more I want to move the stand further down. I'm not hating on Stephen King because I like Stephen King. But when you look at the other stuff in the A tier, like they're way better. But also they're not because the stand also gives you this weird future look at like America after it's collapsed in a way that seems a lot more plausible now since 2020. I mean, Holy crap, man, who would have thought that a virus could kill a bunch of people? Ugh. You only imagine reading something like The Stand in 2020. That'd be a trip. I think I'm going to end it here. This is a real long video. I want to thank you for checking this out. I've got a lot of science fiction that I've reviewed on my channel and I plan on doing more. I just put out a video not too long ago about my must reads in vintage science fiction for the rest of the year. And I'm pretty sure that some of those should be up here too, but they're not. And we'll find out why when I read them. I'll let you know about that in the future. Thanks for watching. Watching. And with that, I'll see you next time.